Oh, it's really great to be here as I, for many, many reasons and not just temperature. Uh, <laughs> so um, this is joint work and uh, just to explain where it comes from. Um, so the first group of authors um, were all centered around the second author, Irvin Geary. And I think they are all former, current um, or former students of uh, Irvin. At the bottom is, is current, and I think Chuan Chi is also current. Um, but this was during my Fulbright visit to Rainy, and it was a great time. It was in the fall of 2019. And um, then I followed this up and I uh, started doing some of this work with Chris Cox. And actually, I think most of the talk will cover the stuff with Chris, but it's the same basic topic. So, uh, so it will come together. Okay. So I, I think you all are familiar with this, but let me just start with the slide and with the motivation for why one even considers uh, the planar graphs. And so the question that, that was an old, old question was, can every map be colored with four colors? And the drawing of the a graph in the plane without crossing edges is called a plane graph. And if I can move this even further, I cannot. Okay, that's as far down as it goes. So its regions form a uh, planar graph. So, um, or a, sorry, form a plane map. So what you're seeing here is a plane map and the graph with the vertices, of course, is a plane graph. Um, we use the, the term plane graph to distinguish from planar. Uh, plane graph is actually a drawing in the plane. Ah. Yeah. This thing is not, sorry. No, it's okay. Um, so I'll do, because this is boring and everybody's seen this, so <laughs> I'll just. Sorry, <laughs> I don't know how to make that. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> I'll figure. It. I'll try to remember what I'm actually looking at. Now, we use the arrows. We don't use the arrows. Ah, oh, because because we're not there. Okay, um, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, just some notation that we're going to use. It's very familiar if you have done planar graphs. Uh, v is a set of vertices. Uh, e is a set of edges. F is the set of faces. And uh, I guess this theorem is Euler's theorem. It's certainly Euler's formula, or at least one of many Euler's formulas. And it's v minus e plus f equals two for any plane graph. And a, a graph for which a plane graph drawing exists is called a planar graph. And this is the most interesting planar graph because it's the most dense. It's a, well, if you judge density in a certain way, and it's a K5 minus an edge. And the edge that's missing is, uh, which one is the edge missing? It's this one, which if you don't mind, you couldn't see what I just did. All right. <laughs> so the degree of a vertex is the number of edges incident to V. You're familiar with that. The degree of a face is the number of edges incident to the face, except for bridges, which count twice. And uh, so if you look at this drawing, you can see there's a couple of um, three faces. The outer face has many, uh, has a very large degree. Um, where you see some of the leaves, you have a one, two, three, four, five. Uh, degree phase. All right, and there is what I, what I was just calling a handshake um, for plane graphs. And so for every plane graph, and I'm sort of emphasizing it's a plane graph here. So I'm picking some particular drawing in the plane. Twice the number of edges is equal to the sum of the degrees of the vertices, which is equal to the sum of the degrees of the faces. So if you've done planar graph stuff, you know that there, for every planar graph, there's a dual graph, and the dual graph um, the vertices become faces and the faces become vertices. Okay. And there's, there's uh, interesting corollaries here. Um, so the first thing is that we have bounds on the number of faces in terms of the number of edges for a trivial reason that the degree of every face is at least three, except in the very trivial case where your graph has exactly one edge. And that edge counts twice, but there's only two there for that face. But otherwise, it's at least three. So the number of faces is at most two thirds the number of edges. 
And if your graph happens to be bipartite, you can't have any three things. And so it's at least four. And again, the exceptional case is that if there's exactly one edge, and so the number of faces is at most one half the number of edges. But if you plug that back into Euler's formula, you get some, a couple of very famous formulas. One is that the, for a plane graph or plane graph, the number of edges is at most three V minus six. And if it's bipartite, it's at most two V minus four, except for the case where you have a K2. In fact, these formulas work even with isolated vertices. In fact, isolated vertices only help. So the actual only exception is K2. And I guess K1, but all right. And uh, so this immediately allows us to conclude two different graphs are not planar. K5 cannot be planar because it violates the first condition. It violates the first condition. The second graph, K33, the first condition is okay because it has nine edges and three times six minus six is 12. So it's perfectly fine. But it is a bipartite graph and therefore it violates the second one and therefore it can't be planar. And of course, if you do something silly like put degree two vertices in amongst the edges, then of course that's not planar also because topologically it's the same thing. And of course, the, the famous result of uh, Kurtowski and Wagner, um, Kurtowski, uh, G has no subdivision of K5 to K33. That's true if and only if the graph is planar. And it has no minor of a K5 to K33 if and only if it's planar. And we usually think about subdivisions. I think that's, for me, that's the easiest thing to think about. But uh, your mileage may vary if you actually know any topology, which I do not. All right, so uh, Hakimi and Schmeichel. Um, defined the maximum number of copies of a graph in an in-vertex planar graph. Well, maybe they didn't define it, but we're retroactively assigning that quantity to them. And it's a typical sort of uh, Turan counting thing. And so the, the number, the maximum number of copies of an edge in a planar graph is 3n minus 6. Now we established an upper bound. You do have to establish a lower bound, but establish the lower bound and actually establish that there are an exponential number of planar triangulations and shockingly got pretty much the exact, exact value. I think there's one plus little of one there, but that's, that's uh, the number of planar triangulations you got. So not only do you have the three and minus six is it achieved, but for large enough n, it's achieved by a huge, huge number. Of And they also went to uh, counting triangles. And they established that if n was at least three, then their maximum number of triangles was 3n minus eight. Not minus six, minus eight. So you don't quite get a triangulation. Um, and the example that they got was exactly this thing here. I was calling it the purse. Even though it looks like a fancy purse, you might say it's a mask. It ties away all the way around the back of the face. I don't know. Um, but uh, they got three and minus eight triangles. Okay, so it's a reasonable result. And they also got C4s. It's the same thing, the same thing maximizes it. And it's roughly n squared over two. Now they they put a lot of work into the low order terms, and if you know. Uh, where my education comes from, I'm really focused on the first order terms. And the second order terms, uh, I'm not so concerned about. Of course, yeah, C4 is a K22. That will come up later. So you can, if you have a C4, then you can generalize it in two ways. You generalize it as a cycle, or you generalize it as a complete bipartite graph. And we'll do both. And then uh, after lying dormant for a while, Alon and Caro picked it up. I think this is like Noga's seventh paper or something like that. So it's very early, very, very early. So they got a nice, perfect formula for counting stars. So uh, this is K1K. So it's a star with K leaves. This is the formula. The main term is, of course, um, you're going to fix K and let N go to infinity. So it's roughly um, n to the k, two times n to the k over k factorial is the first order term. They have this term of n minus four times four choose k, which is of course zero if k is bigger than four. And then this 
on our last term in terms of k. It's the same extremal branch. It's the same. Then they decided, well, we got k1k, what about k2k? And this theorem looks really complicated. But um, you know, I, for my selfish purposes, if I say I only care about large enough n, then the first line and the third line and the last line are the ones that I care about. If you fix k and let n go to infinity. But there's, there's several interesting configurations, which I really won't discuss, that happen if n is small. So some things are allowed to happen when n is small that's, that doesn't happen when n gets larger. Okay, so again, if you want to rewrite this the way I would like to, it's uh, roughly n to the k over k factorial is the first order term. And then there's smaller terms that are of order n to the k minus one. And then and I'll be just reminding you that the extremal example is this mass. Uh, in particular, this is just a special case I'm pulling this out. Uh, if you uh, pick the path on uh, three vertices, then uh, we get n squared plus 3n minus 12. And uh, a group consisting of four of my co authors and Casey Tompkins um, established the exact value for C5, and they got a couple of uh, annoying uh, configurations. I'll consider them annoying, but they're also beautiful. And again, I won't show them because I've done enough Tixi for this talk, and it would involve a lot more to do the seven configuration. Uh, five is not so bad. But uh, if n is sufficiently large, it's roughly 2n squared. And uh, let's see, they got p4. Uh, again, some really nasty configurations, n equals 8, n equals 7. Um, it's, I would say that it's sort of a coincidence that it works for 5 and 6 that we get the same formula. For n at least 9, uh, though, you get 7n squared. And uh, they proved that uh, if you had any path, then they got the right exponent. They could figure it out. It's the floor of k minus one over two plus one. That's the right exponent for n. And there are these, there are these constants that uh, show up, that upper and lower constant. All right. And then this is a very recent result by. Uh, Chun Hong Lu from 2021. It was just posted in the archive a few months ago. And it says for all H, there exists a case such that this number is theta of n to the k. So if you pick, pick a graph that you're trying to count and you want to count the number of, maximum number of copies of it in a planar graph, he established that based on that graph, there is some parameter k, which he actually is able to describe. And then you get upper and lower bounds of the order of n to the k. All right. Um, I think it's useful in analyzing this result to see why the extremal example gives you the uh, value it does. So you get seven n squared plus junk. So what, what we first look at is we, we sort of um, count these according to where they're appearing in the mass. So this first example has uh, one edge sitting in the middle of the mass. You can barely see it when it's red there towards the bottom. And then, um, and then you choose this one and this one. So um, the way you might look at it, I guess, is maybe you could choose the edge first. I believe there are uh, n minus three edges to choose. And then I have two choices for the vertex to pick, two choices for the direction to go left to right, and then I have n minus four choices for the last vertex. So that's how you get four of this type. But there are other types. Uh, there's a type like this. And so for this one, uh, you have two choices for which direction to go. Is does it have does the degree one vertex sit here, or does it sit does it sit on the left, or does it sit on the right? I'm trying to help the people who are online. So I, I like to point, so, um, so I hope you can follow me. And so there are two n squared of this type and there's n squared of this type. Of course, it's two times n minus two choose two, so it's, it's n squared. And there, this is where you take the handle or the strap of the mask 
and then that's your center edge, and then the other two. And then there's a smaller order term uh, of some others. For instance, the strap of the mask could be uh, could be a pendant edge. But we don't really count those because those are asymptotically ranged. Okay, so so that's P five. Um, yeah, that's P four. That's P five. So notice that the order of magnitude has changed. Uh, so the order of magnitude was n squared for P two and P three. We had uh, n squared and seven n squared, and now we have n cubed. And basically, they all look the same, at least for the higher order term. If you want the cubic term, then what you have to have is that the Second and the fourth vertices have to be these huge degree vertices. And if you think about that, if, if you restrict yourself to this configuration, it's sort of obvious that that's going to be exactly how you're going to count these. If the second and fourth vertices do not have high degree, you can guarantee that you'll have one low order of magnitude. And we can strip this, um, and it doesn't change the asymptotic scope. Notice that we couldn't strip this for the um, path P4. For P4, we needed those the extra edges in the mask and the extra edges edge in the handle for the right order of magnitude. And so what do we do when we got the, the P5? And you will notice we do not have an exact answer here. So, and I can give you about three different points in the proof where that would be hopeless. So, so we just let M be sufficiently large and we didn't even worry about what the second order term was when that was the case. We just got the coefficient. And notice that we knew that it had to be a constant times N of three. They had established that before. So we, we were just working for the constant. And the big lemma here, which is one that I, I really hadn't heard of, um, and it's very similar to the handshaking lemma for planar graphs, but it's, uh, it's quite a bit stronger. So you let n be greater than or equal to k greater than or equal to three and let g be a planar graph on n vertices such that you have a subset of k vertices, k is at least three. And then you have this front loaded degree sequence. So not only is the number of edges bounded, but if you take a small subset of vertices, then and small subset, say 20, then the sum of the degrees is two and even though the sum of the degrees is going to actually uh, overall could be as high as six n. But if you just say pick 20 vertices, it's going to be two n. Now, eventually, the 6k term catches up with you. If k is large enough, then that actually contributes. But if you think about a small number of vertices, then basically the sum of those degrees is two n. The proof of this is exceedingly trivial, and it has to do with uh, looking at s. And then the bipartite graph between S and everything that's not S. The sum of the degrees of the graph induced by S, well, that's a planar graph. So it must be divided by 6K minus 12. And then if you take the rest of the ed edges, then uh, that's a bipartite planar graph. And so that's bounded by 2N minus 4. Uh, this is why we need a K to be at least 3 then. But if k equals two, I think it's pretty clear that basically this formula works as well because you no know, vertex can have degree more than n minus one. So, all right, you 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 don't quite get this inequality, but you get pretty close. Okay. So then we took a look at this and we said, well, if I want to count the number of p fives in a graph, what can I do? I can order the degrees. And I can just say, let's focus on the second and fourth vertices of my path. And so what I do is I just fix, uh, fix some vi and vj. I compute the co-degree, that's the number of third vertices. And then I look at the degrees of the second and fourth, that will give me the first and third. So this formula is pretty easy to see, I think. But of course, the co degree is greater than, is less than or equal to the minimum of the two degrees. And the minimum of the two degrees, well, we know what that is. We put them in order, and Vj was just designated to be that. So with this degree sequence, the number of P5s is bounded by the summation of the degree of Vi, which is the higher degree vertex, 
times the degree of dj squared. Now, I point out that this might be a wild overcount, right? Because I, I'm now not concerning myself with a lot of, I've drawn a lot away here. Uh, in the example that I showed you, we didn't really count the vertices that were, say, uh, next to each other on the, in the mask as being second and four. So, I mean, this, this could be a crazy overcount. But we didn't care because we only care about asymptotics, so why not? And so we said, well, this is, this is a problem that we're trying to solve. Can we actually get the answer? Because we know the lower bound of n cubed because we know it from that construction. So we just have to match it. And so we just have to maximize that thing, subject to that thing, subject to uh, a linear number of constraints. Um, and notice that the second constraint there, I, all I need to do is uh, take the first k vertices because I ordered them by degree. And so this is just a degree count. I'm not even focusing on the graph theoretic structure, let alone the topological structure. And then we, we had to have one last thing, uh, six out of minus 12. For some value, at some value k, uh, the second constraint becomes trivial. And so you have to fill in this last constraint. Turns out the solution is n cubed plus big O of n squared. So we got what we wanted. Uh, the proof is sort of a case analysis of how bad the beginning of the sequence is. If the beginning of the sequence is not too bad. It turns out this is small anyway. If the beginning of the sequence is very, very good, we're very close to our mask. And if it's somewhere in between, it's annoying and we need some n to be larger than 11,664 to actually make the proof go through. I don't know why that was so easy to pluck out, but somehow 11,664 worked. So we reduced it to this, uh, to this optimization problem, and we're perfectly happy with that. And then we were done, and I came back, and uh, Chris was back at Iowa State, and we were, were all masked up, and we... Uh, it, it had been a year since I'd worked on this problem and we started discussing it. And we said, well, what, what about P7? Um, for a variety of reasons, P6 is a lot harder. P7 is easier. Uh, I can tell you why it's e easier to do P7 because I have second, fourth, and sixth vertices. But with P6, they don't alternate nicely. And so that creates a problem. And it turns out that we got four over 27 and our extremal graph is different. It's not the same. Uh, Irvin had uh, conjectured that this was the kind of structure we would want for larger paths. And he was right for P7, so probably right otherwise. So um, this, uh, the construction here, I, you might think of this as some sort of uh, hexagon, but I think of it as a triangle that you have three vertices of huge degree and there's a K2T in between them where T is roughly n over three. And I could put extra edges in there, but I'm not gonna bother because it doesn't affect the asymptotics. But those extra edges would affect it if it were P6. Well, the same sort of argument passes through for C6. So P7 is very similar to C6 in that sense. And you get uh, N cubed over 27. You may notice that our error terms are not as nice as others, although we don't have a little o. We actually get a step. There's no, there's no particular magic there. It's just that uh, the method that we used to prove it couldn't get a second order term better than four minus one fifth, but we're pretty sure it should be n cubed in the first case and n squared in the second case. All right. C8. And over four to the fourth. And uh, the configuration is what we might expect it is. And it's big O of n to the four minus one fifth. One note I would make is this is what I would call, and I'm going to call it later, a planar blow up of a four cycle. It's not a planar blow up of a four cube, which I'll get into hopefully if we have some time. And so we got this um, general result, which worked for um, all M's, but was not quite perfect. 
So of course, the, uh, the exponent on n had already been established. Uh, it was established for paths, and I think it, I'm pretty sure it was established for cycles already by my co-authors. And uh, I think that's also in uh, Lou's paper. So, um, so that, that was established, but here we get upper and lower bounds um, on constants. And one thing I'd point out is that I, I think these are actually really good because maybe it's deceiving that the upper bound has a one over m minus one factorial in the first line. The other one has basically an m to the m in the denominator. But that's, if you take the ratio, that's exponential in m rather than factorial in m. So, so it's, it's not so bad. Um, but that was, that was our general result for paths and cycles. Uh, and then we uh, we started beating on our uh, general result to sort of get other values. We were able to get 10 and 12. Uh, and we got the conjectured results for 10 and 12. We didn't bother much with the lower order term now. Now we have a little low. And that's, uh, we didn't, we have a sort of general approach to things and it doesn't, it gets the first order term, but it doesn't, it doesn't really worry too much about the second order. Um, and in fact, it, it generalizes a lot more than this. So what we could do is let H, the thing that we're counting, be some planar graph, and then we want to blow it up. And so we put these strange curly braces around the K because we were inventing notation. Um, and uh, so the planar blow up of H by K is to replace each edge with a K to K. So the, what I've drawn here is an example of C6 blown up by three. And so you've seen that, that I wanna emphasize that, th that this is an example of something that we are counting, but remember that in the examples of the things that were extremal, they were also blow-ups, planar blow-ups. So it's a little bit. And what we were able to show uh, was that if you had a graph like this, we were able to get upper and lower bounds, again, that differ by, uh, we should differ by, yeah, something that's exponential in M, but not factorial in M. Um, but uh, in the case where H, the original graph that you're blowing up, either has a minimum, either K times delta minus one is at least two. So either delta has to be at least three or K has to be at least two and delta has to be at least two. So those two cases. If delta is one and K is at least nine, it also works. But for some reason we couldn't get anything for delta equals one and K between eight and um, uh, three. So, um, and that's just an artifact of the proof that's not there's not, I don't think there's much reason why that's, uh, that's such a problem. And in fact, if K was really large, we actually got the answer. We were able to improve the upper bound. And so if K is a planar graph, um, where K is roughly this thing, uh, then, uh, then we were able to get the coefficient there. And the lower bound is not anything mysterious. That's, um, that's the blow up of H by the right amount, N over K, something like that. And uh, we, so we will have all of our results get the upper bound. All right. And the, there's sort of a general approach to this with which Chris likes a lot and I do too. And I think it's, it's sort of a neat way to look at graphs in away from the planar setting or anything like that. So let V be a vertex set and let mu be a probability mass on the pairs of that vertex set. So you might as well consider your underlying graph to be complete. So what's a probability mass? Well, you know, it's everything's between zero and one. So I'm weighting the edges between zero and one and some of the weights is one. And for any graph G, I want to define the, uh, the mu value of the graph itself can be the product of the mu's on the edges. Uh, so think of G as a cycle. So this, this V vertex set, I'm not even giving the graph itself a name because I might as well assume that it's complete. But I might, G might be a cycle or path or something like that. 
So we define mu of some graph G to be that, and, um, and any vertex we sum over all the weights sitting at that vertex, and that's mu bar. And so what we do is we basically show that if we're trying to count what we're trying to count, what our underlying graph should look like is one of these planar blobs, sort of. So what, what's going on in the first line of this odd path reduction theory? So I assign a probability mass to the edges. Then I have mu bar of x1, which is counting basically the weighted degree of x1, the weight sitting that x1 can see. And then the product of the weights of the edges of xi, xi plus one, and then the weights of the other vertex. I would point out that this is odd paths. So what's happening is in P5, then M here is equal to two. P5 has two sort of hinge vertices that matter. So the M is not the number of vertices, but it's the number of vertices minus one divided by two. And then among all, um, among all probability masses for some finite V, uh, we find the supremum of this expression. And then we prove that the number of uh, paths of the form 2M plus one is at most rho of M over two times N to the N plus one plus big L of the smaller order term. And that's the general approach. And, and Chris and I both like the, this, just this idea of let's put probability masses on a, a graph. And this is done for various, uh, for various things. It's not terribly new, but it's, it's interesting that it counts this, especially for these, these types of things. There's an even cycle reduction theorem and not much has changed here, except that um, we're taking the product of a mu uh, for all edges in every cycle of the complete graph. So if you notice the summation here, I had it in the previous graph. So um, here, this is, uh, I'm, here I'm summing over all the paths um, and here I'm summing over all the cycles in the complete graph induced by the, the vertex set. And that's it. And then the, the thing that, that gave us the results here was the blow up uh, reduction theorem. And then here, the first line is very complicated. You take the sum over all instances of this graph H and then take the probability of the edges along that that graph, and then we find the supremum overall, um, overall probability masses, and then that gives us the upper bound of the norm. Again, with this one-fifth parity. Okay, so just a couple of notes about, uh, about this thing. The reduction theorems are not structural theorems, and that means that the probability distribution attempts to simulate a planar blow-up, but we can't guarantee that the maximum mu that we get is not, say, a blow up of a K5. So all we're doing is it comes from the very first paper. We take this question and then we create an optimization for it that has nothing to do with the graphs underneath it. So it's entirely possible that the mu is, uh, has um, five choose two positive values on a K5. We can't guarantee that doesn't happen shouldn't happen because I can't think of a graph that we can construct that would produce such a thing. But uh, we weren't able to prove it. And um, we got frustrated sort of saying, of course, it's not true. It has to be planar. You can't have, you, you can't have a non-planar configuration that the, and we just, we couldn't prove it. Um, would, have, would have made some of our later results like the 12 cycle simpler. Um, and we use Lagrange multipliers to compute these, um, these coefficients. Kaushkun Tucker to be specific, precise, but if you don't remember or never learned those, uh, that's just Lagrange multipliers. All right, so let's consider the cycle 2M. I, I wanna do this example. If we use an equal distribution on the edge set of KM, then this, this coefficient that we, 
we compute this data is exactly this. You, um, you want to find all the cycles in a complete graph on M vertices. There are M minus one factorial over two cycles to choose. I'm doing M cycles on M vertices. M minus one. If you spread it one vertex, get them twice the size. Spread it one vertex, they're M minus one factorial halves. Yes. Of one less length. Yes. And then the less symmetry gets easier to do. Yeah, yeah. Then you have to divide by two because you could go the other way. Yeah, and the last Yeah. Right. And of course, each one would get equal weight one over M choose two. But if you look at the equal distribution on the cycle itself, it's a different expression. It's one over M to the M, but in fact, that's larger. Uh, you have to trust me, but for all M, Strictly greater than three. I think it's equal. Of course, it's equal for m equals three because k three and c three are the same thing. But if m is at least four, then we get a strict equality here, which means that we do not want to put our weights on the uh, on the m clique. We would have it on the m, rather have it on the m cycle. Unfortunately for us, those are only two examples of probability masses that we could choose. Either you know you you want to do a Six cycle, well, you could uh, six cycle divide by two. So now I'm going to write on the board, nobody can see. It. But um, but if you let's say we want to do C14, which is the next case. So we know that um, put equal probability mass on C7 is better than on case. But there's no a priori reason why we even need seven vertices. Our um, probability mass could be on 20 vertices and there could be the, some nice configuration that gives you more uh, 14 cycles than, than you would possibly get from that. So, so and you know, we, we wouldn't even be able to go through all the cases. I, I suppose you could, but uh, all the different probability masses on a graph on seven vertices. So anyway, what this says is an equal distribution on CM is better than a uh, equal distribution on K. Okay, so for C10, um, we did actually go through some of this. So, so maybe I'll just give you a flavor of what's going on. So what we proved was that the optimal distribution for C10 is given by a five cycle where the new value of every edge is one fifth. And if mu is optimal, the kuhn kusch tucker conditions end up giving us two inequalities here. Um, And, and uh, let's see, so uh, yeah, so we have these two conditions for every vertex, if we assume mu is optimal. Um, so these come from, if you, if you have an optimal one, then we have uh, different ways of sending an epsilon from one place to another, and that provides a contradiction to optimality. So it has to obey these two conditions for the edges and then for the vertices. Uh, as I said, compare mu to mu prime, which uh, it's the same sort of thing, which sets mu prime equal to zero and rescales the other edges. So if you have some configuration, find one of them that's positive, any one of them, delete it, and then rescale, and compare it to what you had before, and it turns out that uh, that's not better, that can't be better. And so, um, the corollary of that ends up being that the support, the total number of vertices on which you have support is five, which is great. Now I only have five vertices to worry about, but then it also gives that the sum is two over M, which in this case is five, which um, 
it's not too hard to figure out that that implies that you're going to have one fifth on each edge, on each of each edge in the center. So the lemma that from before gives that the the mu bar is greater than uh, 0.355 for every v in the support. But since the sum of the support is two, that means the support has to be five. Right. Because if you have at least 0.355 and you have six things, uh, that's it. six times 0.355 is greater than two. So you can't have six things to support. But since we're concerned with counting the 10 cycle, which reduces to the five cycle, then we need at least five vertices to actually count this thing at all. So the support must be equal to five. And Kerwin Kush Tucker gives uh, mu bar is less than equal because of this is mu bar is less than equal to two fifths so equality must hold and that gives you the first and second phase. And then what we did was uh, we did a uh, compare mu to mu prime which sets mu prime equal to zero and does it differently scaling. So for this third lemma, uh, we had to assume the first couple of lemmas. We had to assume in particular, corollary two. But with corollary two, now we have five vertices. So I can get a handle on five vertices. So we actually uh, do something a little bit more clever to show this inequality. And uh, again, the idea of the proof is just to do a rescaling. And then the corollary is if Z, Z satisfies that, then mu of E uh, is greater than zero to five. And, um, so the idea of that is set z equal to two thirds. It satisfies the lemma. So mu of e is greater than two thirds, and uh, since the sum of all the edges um, at vertex is equal to two fifths, the degree of v must be less than three. This is the expansion, and that's it. So. Um, so in fact, the support of mu must be a maximum degree two graph on five vertices with at least one five cycle, and that's the five cycle, and that's all you have. So the support of mu must be C5. It's, it's not terribly long. It's, it's sort of hard to describe in a talk like this, but, the, but it's not so bad. Uh, it's, the C12 was more complicated and involved in more cases. What I will point out is that, for, and I don't know if I have this in the slides, the support for C14, um, I, th I think this is true. I think it's just eight, but it's not seven. Seven is easy. If you told me it was seven, I could I could run through the Kuhn Kush Tucker conditions. Here it's eight, and I'm not sure if there's some really nice algebraically defined graph on which I can count a lot of C7s, and then that will give the count of C14s. I'm not sure. So uh, there are open questions and all of these are the first uh the coefficient of the first order term that we don't know so what is the count for cm for even cycle starting at 14 or the path for odd path starting at nine um the odd cycles are harder i think significantly harder our meta theorem that we use it gives it uh, proves again the right order of magnitude, the right exponent for uh, for cycles and paths, but it's not good at computing the exponent. And that's because, or uh, the coefficient. The reason why it's not good at computing the coefficient is that these extra edges that I could delete in the mask, in the center of the mask and the uh, strap of the mask, they're absolutely necessary for odd cycles and for even paths. So, and that makes it hard to deal with, which I think you might be able to deal with, but we, we just couldn't, we, we couldn't really do anything general enough to make it work. Yeah, so, okay, so I, I did have it in the slide. So for C14, when you try to compute beta of seven, we could get the, uh, the support was eight vertices at most, not seven, which is what we would like. In general, actually, we didn't have too bad a time. Uh, in computing this beta of m, we require less than 1.26 times m vertices. So the number of vertices 
it, at least in the cycle case, is not crazy. It's, it's barely more than the number of vertices we're looking for. But we have no reason, um, no ability to prove any of that. So I think, you know, I, it, if you really want to look at this as a sort of different problem, you say for a given graph H, what is the mu on some KN for all values of N? It maximizes the probability of finding an H by choosing E of H edges independently at random from mu. And we've, this is, this generalizes what we were doing, but uh, this may or may not actually uh, solve the problem for counting graphs and planar graphs. One of the reasons is the answer might be a configuration that's not planar. Then we don't know what to do. We have an upper bound, but we don't know what to do. But this, this is sort of the general question that, that I think is of independent interest and just choose edges at random from some distribution. But what you're interested in is maximizing the result, maximizing the probability, even not the expectation. And uh, you know, can you can you take our results and sort of easily get exact results? It seems likely. It seems like that. Okay, we have our results. We know that a blow up of a C five is is the right answer, at least numerically, for finding copies of C ten. But can we get the fact that can we get some sort of stability that says? If we are not close to that structure, then we are not close to the number, and therefore you use stability. And then say, if we're close to that structure, we can move a few edges here and there, and put in straps, and put in uh, extra edges in the mask, and get uh, something more precise. And I don't know. That seems that seems like it might be a lot of work. That's all I have. Thank you. Do we want to stop sharing or not? I don't know how you want to do that. Let's see. Oh, control L, I guess you can just. So you were in the right on the obstacle and the screen there. So what would change if you look at any other fixed points of surface? Yes. Are the main types staying the same? Everything works because we don't even worry about um, the topological issues. What, what works for us. What works for us is that the graph has to be a linear number of edges. So the class of graphs that we're considering instead of planar the class can have a linear number of edges. Actually, it can be slightly more than linear, but let's say linear and have no copy of a K3T for some value of T. And of course, a planar graph satisfies that and more, but uh, that's all we need for our reduction first. And so it works for any genus because there, for every genus, there exists some T so that the K3T cannot be drawn on that surface. So, so it works for those. Uh, for more complicated topology, I don't Yeah, we looked that up recently and after somebody had asked a similar question and but I don't think it actually shows up in the paper. Yeah, are there any other questions for Ryan? The largest I can know. That's a fancy skill. And also, like, for even for like, 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 three years of the and also, third floor, then it's like, maybe it's just that we have to do that. There's something that's going on, right? They basically are working on the escape and the escape. 
I, I don't know. I mean, I think we got lucky in that uh, what we got was a blow up. And so, so that was sort of the, the impetus for everything is everything could be treated as a blow up. And if it can't be treated as a blow up, I don't know, I don't know what to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, my inspiration, it, it always is, is back to Semmerides' lemma. So, yeah, you know, it's, it, that is sense is a blow up. Um, it, or at least it takes some sort of, uh, it, it takes things and reduces it to a finite amount, which is what we were doing as well. But it was really that five path thing and noticing the second and fourth vertices were the ones that mattered and everything else was dependent on those. And when she saw that, then the generalization was, was ready to go. And I apologize if I covered Irvin's talk. Did it? Did no, it, you know, no okay. not at all. Okay, <laughs> all right. Any other last questions for Ryan? Doesn't look like it, so let's thank Ryan one more time. Thank you. And thank you everyone for making a note. And uh, I guess we'll we'll uh, we'll convene there. Okay. Or yeah. <laughs>